One thing you cannot do in a meeting with the crown prince, probably I'm the only one that could say this, but a few weeks ago, we announced the kingdom's accomplishment of 100 million tourism visits. This was a 2030 goal. We accomplished it December 31st, 2023. Now we had uh, 60 minutes come in uh, to the kingdom uh, two years ago. And they said, uh, Jerry, this is a $63 billion project. What makes you think that you can do this? We had no idea the Saudis were as warm and hospitable as they are. Habibi, I've been telling you that for 30 years. Number two, we had no idea what this country looks like. It's a beautiful country. I've been telling you this for 30 years. This is very well known. Uh, I happen to think that the kingdom is unbelievably blessed to have two visionaries at one time. Do you agree with the undertone seems to be quite popular these days in neighboring countries that Saudi is a sleeping giant? Well, uh, you know, we have our critics. Mm -hmm. We had our doubters. Let's praise King Abdulaziz for unifying this great nation which obtained G20 status faster than any country. So to have the honor to be part of that team to execute both their vision is the honor of my 56-year uh, career. At an altitude of 37,000 feet, we soar. With a rich legacy of honoring our guests and a unique style that has resonated with the world for 78 years. We carry the name of our country on every journey and across every sky. We are Saudi. We welcome you in our own way. We shape our present and build our future. Saudia, our name and country, our style and approach, striving for excellence in everything we do. This is how we fly. We did it again. Oh, you did Luckily, it he was my best friend. Oh, wow. So he came back in the next day and we shot again. Wow. That's yeah, really but that was take two. Little did anyone know. Little deal. Yeah. 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 What it? Ready? Yes. Mr. Jerry, you ready? All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. Jerry, thank you so much for your time today. Assalamu um, alaikum. Ramadan kareem. Ramadan kareem to you too. Way earlier than I'm normally uh, up in Ramadan. But uh, for you, I'll get up of any hour of the day so I can have thank this you. conversation with you. Thank you again so much for your time. Thank you, man. Always a pleasure, man. Uh, it's, it's my honor. And, and just to kick off, I mean, we know of the mega or giga projects that are happening in the kingdom. But Dir'iyya seems to be flying under the radar. And every time I come to Riyadh and I, and I, and I happen to be driving past this road, which is a lot, I was like, how is this project, which looks like it's halfway there, Flying under the radar, ne Neom gets you know gets all the the, the headlines. Uh, Gidea, you hear about it a lot, but Diraiya, there's a lot going on over here. What can we expect of the project to look like when it's done in a few years' time? Well, first of all, it's great to see you, and congratulations on making this platform so meaningful. Um, it's uh, it goes without saying that we're very proud of you personally, because you've maintained your credibility, your authenticity. And that's why it's a pleasure to sit with you. So congratulations to you. I think you embody all the great goals of the future when we see Saudi talent like yourself. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, we playfully within the family say there's only one Dereya. Yeah. And there's a lot of explanations of why we so proudly say that. But there's also a little bit of a different philosophy on how the Giga projects are to be presented or how they came out of the box, so to speak. Now, if you look at NEOM, a project that we're all very, very excited about, um, especially because it crystallizes the vision of His Royal Highness in terms of what will quality of life be like if you could start from the beginning uh, in 2040 and 2050 and 2060, as he takes a bigger global role as a G20 and I believe sometime a G10 leader. So because it's so ambitious, it, it piques the interest of everybody because, wow, what is Neom? What does it represent? Now, visually, what it looks like in renderings is breathtaking. So everybody says, is that possible? Can you do it? 
And that created a whole wave of excitement, some controversy around the world in its ambition. Okay, you think about all the other Giga projects, Red Sea, Gidea, you know, Roshan. Now, Didea, the birthplace of the kingdom, the ancestral home of Al Saud, uh, fell into my hands because I've been in uh, tourism for 50 years, probably the greatest honor of my life. But I have a different approach to it. And that is that a lot of times giga projects or mega projects, as they used to be called around the world, they announce great ambition, but you don't see it for five or 10 years. So not Saudi Arabia, but other countries that I've worked in, there's, there's perception of you announce big things, but you don't get them done. We're contrary to that. So I maintained especially for three years, 18, 19, and 20, 2018, 19, and 20, we're not going to talk to the media about Derea. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the media and our own public, our public first, and show them results then announce because it immediately establishes credibility. Now, we had uh, 60 Minutes come in uh, to the kingdom uh, two years ago, and they said, uh, Jerry, this is a $63 billion project. What makes you think that you can do this? What makes you think you can develop it? And I said to uh, the correspondent, John Wertham, I said, John, do you know where you're sitting? You're sitting in Bajeri Terrace. Now, we're a, we're a 2030 project. You're already sitting in deliverable assets that the Crown Prince has accomplished. So the fact that we opened assets in 2021, December, opened assets to UNESCO World Heritage Site and the Bajeri Terrace. By the way, we just topped 2 million visits to, to today. The fact that we opened and introduced our hotel practice, our museum practice, nine kilometers of parks in December 23. Wait till you see what we, what we announced December 24 and a spectacular array of assets for December 25 on our way to Expo Vision 2030, right? So this was a bit of my strategy that I'd rather suspend or be a little bit later in Derea, Derea, Derea until people can see it. Now, the good news is even Derea, 300 years of history, goes back to the, the Crown Prince's principal goal of quality of life. Yeah. So now we put in 12 kilometers of sidewalks, streets, street lamps, we planted six million trees, bushes, shrubs, palm trees, right? So now our public, even last night, every day people stop me and say, Mr. Jerry, they can't pronounce it in Zerillo. Mr. Jerry, thank you for what you've done for my family. I, I see my wife jogging. I see the kids out in the parks playing. You know, the Wadi Hanifa now, nine kilometers, beautiful. So this makes me so happy that I see thousands of our neighbors enjoying the quality of life, which was the intention of the Crown Prince. Yeah. It's very popular, Bujeri today. Yeah. I, I was there for MISC. And I, I, I keep finding myself, when in Riyadh, I'm from Jeddah, but when I'm in Riyadh, I keep finding myself in the Dira'iya area. And that's going to be more and more and more, because another thing we did, which I have to praise the Crown Prince and the board, they allowed us to put a substantial amount of infrastructure in ahead of time. This is very important because in urban, in urban planning generally, you build your magnet assets and then you put the urban uh, landscape around it. Yeah. It's almost like you bake the cake and then you put the frosting on it. W what the Crown Prince and the board allowed us was to put substantial infrastructure. This is very, very important because instead of being a giga project that's choppy where you see results every five years, right? What we're able to do is we're able now to open assets, groundbreak on assets, and announce assets every single year until 2030. This gives the community a higher quality of life, a higher confidence that can be done. Now, what we're also seeing, and you know this firsthand, we're now seeing an unprecedented amount of global media coming into the kingdom to cover um, His Royal Highness's vision of Vision 2030 in each stream, mm -hmm. you know, 2030 streams, right? Well, uh, you know, we have our critics, mm -hmm. we had our doubters, but I will tell you circa 2018, 
Fifty percent of the media came in was suspect. Was suspect. Can you do this? It's overly ambitious, mm. right? Mm. Do you know now, with a hundred times more media than we had even six, seven years ago, we get very little of that because you know what happens? They come here to DGDA. They see the model of the crown prince's vision because when you see those models, you really see his vision, right? Then they go out and see the actual buildings and then they have a meal and then they walk around and then they interact with a warm and generous society and they get they see Saudi hospitality and they all say the same thing. We had no idea. We had no idea. Good. But you know what you know what's interesting about that same media? Instead of hitting it and coming they're coming back every year now. And every year, you know we hear number here's here's what we hear in the order. Now also I have the privilege of serving on the Saudi Tourism Authority, right? Which are doing an, an amazing job. And the Ministry of Tourism, an amazing job, thanks to His Excellency Al Khatib. What we're seeing now is number one of positives for the country. We had no idea the Saudis were as warm and hospitable as they are. Habibi, I've been telling you that for 30 years, right? So that's a great thing because your country is great because your people are great. Warm, hospitable, generous. Number two, we had no idea what this country looks like. It's a beautiful country. I've been telling you this for 30 years. But until you come, that's why tourism is important, you break stereotypes of deserts and camels and, you know, all wrong stereotypes, right? But number three that we're hearing with great regularity now, every year I come back, it's astonishing how the kingdom is changing. Of course, they're coming and they're seeing progress in Derea. They're seeing a beautiful Red Sea with the great job uh, that John Pagano and his team are doing in the Red Sea. They see historic Jeddah come into life, yeah. right? They see the spectacular progress of Neom. They see the seven UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So that now, even those that were critical of ours, right, are now optimistic because they see the Crown Prince executing, not just on health and welfare and education and defense and all the things that keep a society healthy and happy, but they see the Giga projects. And this is a very important point. A few weeks ago, we announced the kingdom's accomplishment of 100 million tourism visits. This was a 2030 goal. We accomplished it December 31st, 2023. Seven years before Correct. the target. So then what happened is that the crown prince was unbelievably proud, yeah. but you know him. The same day, he said, okay, well, now let's make it $150 billion. Yes, so, yes, yes. You know, rightfully so. Right, and rightfully so, because you have to, you have to chase your goals. Do, indeed. Before we started shooting, you showed me, showed me a picture of you in the day in 98, uh, in the same spot that you took a picture at in 2024. Was it a love story between you and Saudi from back then, which was one of your earlier visits? In short, what made you choose Saudi and call it your first or second home? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a very thoughtful question. Thank you. Um, Saudi Arabia, uh, for many years, frustrated me hmm. because I've been blessed to have wonderful Saudi friends my whole life, starting in college. And uh, geopolitics aside, uh, I had the chance to visit the kingdom since 1981. Oh, wow, since 81. Okay. Right, now different now yeah. than then. Of course, all were well-intentioned, right? Each king had monumental accomplishments as the society progressed, right? But what frustrated me was that it wasn't politically correct or wasn't commercially correct mm -hmm. to open the kingdom to tourism until we did so in September of 2019. Now, what bothered me is I know the Saudi hospitality and generosity, but if you don't open the kingdom to tourism, how will your public know that unless they've had friends like I had, right? If you, if you don't open up the kingdom, how can you show them 45% of the Red Sea? How can you show them the largest sand desert in the world? How can you show them the largest palm grove of Lavasa, the mountains of Asir? How can you show them this, right? So thank God to, uh, and may God always protect and praise the custodian of the two holy mosques, King Salman, God bless him, and the crown prince for doing that. Because in rapid time now, 
the world are changing their perceptions on it. So with me, when I was in the region, and I've been in the region a long time, I opened the Royal Mirage in uh, Dubai 26 years ago, Atlantis now is 16 years ago. I had the privilege of being on both those teams. So I came to study today because one of my friends said it was the birthplace of the kingdom. It's the house of Al Saud. Well, if that's the case, why doesn't anybody know about it? So in one conversation with the crown prince years ago, your Royal Highness is Dedea, factually, emblematically, similar to what the Colosseum represents to the Greeks. Is it emblematically, symbolically, the same as the Colosseum to, um, I meant the Acropolis in Greece, the, the Colosseum in, right. in Rome, yes. Well, this is the birthplace of Asalud. So that's when I said, there's only one Dedea, <laughs> you know. So uh, my respect, my love uh, activated when Vision 2030 activated. Because after 50 years in the business, I want in on that. <laughs> and, you know, we, today is made out of mud. I said, I got to be a brick in that wall. But at the same time, that was my second motivation. My principal motivation was to come and contribute to activate the potential of all the young Saudis, men and women, great future leaders, people who are distinguishing themselves like you, like my colleagues. You know, we're 2,419 as of last Thursday. The average age of my staff is 31. You take me out, it probably goes to 24, right? But this blessed kingdom is on its way. It's already great, but it's on its way to super greatness. And its people will determine the course of that. Uh, well, the crown prince will do the course. They'll determine the speed of it. And I'm very optimistic about that. Can you recall a conversation or one of your early conversations with His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman? and how that conversation went, or one that stayed with you the most, an interaction or a conversation that you've had with him? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, this is very well known. Uh, I happen to think that the kingdom is unbelievably blessed to have two visionaries at one time, to have the custodian of the Dooley Mosque and to have uh, His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince. I credit the king, which is super easy, as everybody should, because if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have the integrity in today, and especially the UNESCO site. And while there were amazing people involved, uh, Dr. Fahad al-Samari, His Excellency, His Excellency Ibrahim al-Sultan, His, His Highness Prince IF, that contributed to uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Site designation for today in 2010, um, it was the king that showed his love of today mm. to give it the importance that it has now. But then, if you take the jewel of the kingdom and you put all the amenities around it without compromising its authenticity and integrity, then you're going to accomplish two things. One is priceless, and that is you're going to reestablish to Saudis the place of their origin, the place of their national identity, and the, and the ongoing sense of pride of being a Saudi. This is your home. Today is your birthplace, right? Then the second thing, is that you're gonna allow people from all over the world to come and see the birthplace of Arabia. That's cool. That's why, also praising uh, His Majesty and the Crown Prince, one of the biggest accomplishments for me was the fact that they and a few others saw the need to have Founding Day on February 22nd, which celebrates the 300 years of today. And now we all, Every year, September 23rd, we go out on the street, we beep our horns, we raise our flags, we love National Day, right? But for me, it was only part of the picture. Okay, let's praise King Abdulaziz for unifying this great nation, which obtained G20 status faster than any country, right? But you have to praise His Majesty and the Crown Prince because we're not 94 years old. The third Saudi state is 94 years old. Mm -hmm. we, have th we have 600 years of history in today, but first Saudi state today, 300 years of history. Let's celebrate that. We're not new, right? So to have the honor to be part of that team to execute both their vision is the honor of my 56-year uh, career. That's profound, honestly, hearing those words. Now, I, I drifted a little bit, forgive me. One of the conversations with the Crown Prince 
is that it, it took only two minutes to see not only his intellect and determination, creativity and ability to process, an extraordinary left brain, right, right brain global leader. But what made me say, I'm going to come and do this myself here, was his, his sincerity. One comment changed everything. I was, you know, living in New York on a plane three weeks a, a month, traveling. You know, we put Forbes Travel Guide in 106 countries. I was having a good life, mm. you know, being an ambassador of tourism all over the world for five-star hotels, four-star hotels. But one thing the Crown Prince said to me, it would mean a lot to us and it would mean a lot to me if you helped us on our journey. That level of sincerity said, I'm in. Now, I had to break that news to my wife. That wasn't easy. But thank God they love it here. And uh, that's what made me come boots on the ground June of 18. مستعد؟ وصلت نكهات ليز الجديدة المانجو والتواب الحارة أمسح كود الكي ار على العبوة حمل تطبيق جوي واكسب جوائز كثيرة المسلسلات يبيلها نكهات جديدة Gives me goosebumps that story and thank you for sharing such a personal uh, bit of detail Did you ever think growing up in Brooklyn if I was to take you back to the early days that one day you would call Saudi or somewhere halfway around the globe home outside of you know what you're familiar with all that you know being the state of, uh, of New York yeah um, I, I think one could uh, one could think romantically that maybe that was but that's not really how life works you know I, I we have a saying in our family that man gives awards and God gives rewards Allah gives rewards I know a few things, and I started in the hotel business 50 hours a week on May 2nd, 1967, right? So that's 57 years now, right? Here's what I know. If you serve with all your heart, you don't have to worry about awards or rewards. God will take care of that. But you have to serve with all your heart. It's got to be sincere. Now, I'm a Catholic kid from, I'm an Italian Catholic kid from Brooklyn, so it's not... Uh, it's not normal that I would uh, reference the Holy Quran, the great book. But there is something in the Quran that I love so deeply. As a matter of fact, it, it, it's been with me my whole life. But the fact that it's, uh, that it's in the Quran means a lot to me. It's in many holy books. And that is, may Allah accept all your good deeds. <laughs> may Allah accept your good intentions because your intentions will go to good deeds. If you serve with all your heart without the expectation of reward, Allah, God, has you covered. Takes you, care of the rest, yeah. It takes care of all the rest, and it works. Now, what happens is that the, the great entertainer Sting, he said in one of his songs, we may not share the same ideology, but we share the same biology, mm -hmm. right? Now, we may not share the same theology, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, but we're all human. If you welcome people and create atmospheres of festivity and joy, you will, you will be rewarded when the proper time comes, mm -hmm. right? So that took me all around the world, right? But you can never know that when you're 13. And I think, Jerry, that's something that a lot of people don't have today. They want quick results. They, they don't believe in delayed gratification. And I love what you said that, you know, you just put your heart into it and you can't cheat sincerity, right? No. You put it in and, and, and watch God give it back to you tenfold. Now, if you walk down the road to the best of your ability with humility, praise others, see God's gifts to you, you do not have to worry about how long that road is no. or where the protection comes, yep. right? Yep. Right? You think about the early days of King of Dilazis, just putting those respite res stops, just having water for the pilgrimages, just to make, make it to Mecca and Medina. What, what thoughtfulness, what foresight. And fortunately, every one of his sons, all the kings, followed that generosity of spirit. You don't have to worry about them. They're covered, right? But you get, you get some people now that look for quick fixes. There is no such thing as a quick fix. Now, with Olympic athletes, right, 
who are great musicians. You could use this metaphor in any field of its study. Very simple. You get out what you put in, right? Now, if you're going to be a quick fix, you're going to rise and fall very quickly because you'll have no foundation underneath you. And the foundation is not monetary. The foundation is spiritually. You have to be happy within yourself. So if you don't have to thy own self be true, you may have your successes, but you're going to be very alone and very shallow in those successes. Community is where we are, right? Civilization, think of that word. Mm. The process of being civil to one another. Fabulous, right? True. Fabulous, right? But you, you can't drift from that. Uh, every, every good book has honored thy neighbor. Mm. Not honor thyself, honor thy neighbor, right? Now, we're all human, we're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna get carried away with ourselves. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay. What, where does the word apology come from? Okay, I acted like a dope. I'm sorry, all right? So I think if you carry yourself with humility, the people that I see that think that the world revolves around them, they're not going to have many innings. It all comes naturally to you, Jerry. The way you conduct yourself, I spent some time with your, your, your colleagues, your subordinates, not just today, but in the last few weeks. They speak so highly of you. They love working with you. Does it come naturally to you? Does it feel like work? Do you enjoy the every, I know there's a bunch of questions in there, but do you enjoy the highs, the mediums, and the lows? Um, I, I've yet to meet anybody who's ever enjoyed the lows, but uh, I'll tell you what happens. If you can get yourself emotionally to a point where you know the rain is coming and you're prepared for the rain, right? There's the old metaphor that if you accept the rain, nothing can grow without the rain. Uh, emotionally, that's, that's pretty true. Now, I'm 70. I started as a poor kid at 13. So now, when, when I went to school in Las Vegas, when you're ahead of the casino, it's called playing with house money. Uh, in the eyes of God, I'm playing with house money now. So what am I doing? My, what I'm doing is I'm trying to remain relevant personally where I can contribute to the greater good. But where I get my fuel is from interacting with the young people around me. That one thing I love, love, it's hitting the jackpot, is when you're in a country with resources, mostly human resources, and you can pilot behind a gigantic vision like uh, His Majesty and especially the Crown Prince. Now, the Crown Prince is a great Prime Minister. He's a great leader. Uh, maybe at my age, I'm entitled to say, watch out what, what he accomplishes in the next 10 years. He will not, be, he's already perceived by his peers, G20 peers, as an exceptional leader. It's my personal opinion that in the next 10 years, he'll be one of the great global leaders um, as quality of life transcends from Saudi into the Gulf as a leader into the region and around the world. I think the Crown Prince is, is going to be a, a, a very transformative global leader in that. So on the good times, let us rejoice, right? Only one day, we share our victories together. On the medium times, okay, cool, mm -hmm. we'll, take a, we'll take an average day. On the bumpy times, only one day, when we make mistakes or we have a bad day, we support each other, mm -hmm. only one day. Only one today, each individual is critical to the success of 2030. So what I would say to all Saudis, don't look for the crown prince to execute 2030. Look to yourself to contribute to the execution of 2030. You are the key, only one kingdom, yeah. only one vision 2030. So if you can emotionally prepare yourself, hey, we're gonna have good days when there is Let's dance and act silly and sing and, you know, eat too much and, you know. If they're normal days, thank you, God, we'll take the normal days. If they're bumpy days, this too shall pass. Yeah. And you stick together and you make the bust of it, but it's, it's not easy. Do you agree with the undertone, seems to be quite popular these days in neighboring countries, that Saudi is a sleeping giant? How do you, re how do you react to that sentence? Without a question, right? Now, if you look at Saudi's modern history of 94 years come September, right? 
you're talking about a country uh, that had a small population, relatively uneducated, not sophisticated in terms of global health standards, <laughs> right? Okay, well then, you know, uh, the crown prince, others say uh, that Allah was very good to us because he gave us the two holy mosques and he gave us oil, okay? Well, that changed life in Saudi Arabia. Each of the successive kings moved the society forward in terms of are our people healthy? Mm -hmm. Are they educated? Can they be in a position where they can participate in their own future? Can we be in a position where they can produce families and be happy with those families, where their children can have a better quality of life than what they had, right? All of this in 94 years globally. So is it a sleeping giant? No. Okay. What I would say to you is that it took giant steps, but look where it was coming from 94 years ago. You know what I mean by that? G20 culture. You know, if you look at the United States of America, 1776, you look at France, you look at England, you look, even Spain, Germany, right? They had a long time, right? Now, what my hope and prayer is, is that we accomplish all of those G20 milestones, which we will exceed quickly, without losing our sociological fabric. Mm -hmm. So one of the beautiful things for all Muslims is to celebrate the holy month of, of Ramadan. This is a beautiful thing. You know, in Islam, praying five times a day, this is a beautiful thing because it keeps you connected to God yes. and it reduces your, your arrogance and your uh, lack of humility. Okay, now, the one thing that people say when they come to Saudi is that, wow, people have dinner together as families. In a lot of the G20, that's dissipated. That's not a good thing. You want to keep your sociological fabric. So is Saudi a sleeping giant? I, no, I don't think so. I think if you study Saudi, it's been progressive. However, if you want to talk about speed in between each progression, uh, they were moving very fast. Now they're moving with this crown prince at warp speed. Mm -hmm. So uh, get ready because this giant is going to become a monolith now. Thank you for educating me on the fact that we were the quickest country from inception to G20 status. Correct. I wasn't aware of that. Right. Now, by the way, you're going to get some critics that are going to say, well, come on, you you hit oil. Okay. Well, uh, there's a lot of countries that have yeah, abundant so natural say, resources. Yeah, yeah. You have to have vision mm -hmm. and you have to be able to expedite your vision. Now, in my 50 plus years, I've never seen anybody that has both skill sets. Mm. You know, to this day, DGDA, 14 million square meters of development. To this day, our chairman approves every rendering. To this day, our chairman approves every PMO uh, timetable. Right brain, left brain. To this day, the last I checked, he had a day job, right? But that's how much he loves today. That's how much he loves all the projects, and that's how much he loves his people. Passion. I think it goes back to that as well. Without a doubt. Most passionate person you'll ever meet. But passion is an art. <clears throat> Intellect and expediting is a science. Mm -hmm. You'll find very few leaders in the world that have an equal abundance of art and science, passion and intellect. And by the way, it's reflected in the unbelievable uh, council of ministers that he has around him. Probably one of the most highly educated, highly work uh, productive councils in the world, right? And Saudi Arabia now, another distinction of Saudi Arabia, uh, I'm sure Singapore may be in there, Malaysia is also very capable, but uh, I don't think there's any country in the world where the public sector is working harder than the private sector. You started your career off as a waiter or a busboy in New York City. Any tales you could share with me from those humble beginnings? Oh, I just loved it. You know, as a boy at 13, I grew up so poor. You know, we, we had no heat. We had no hot water. I mean, uh, it seems ridiculous now. But when I went out to school in Las Vegas at 17 to college, uh, there were two boys to a room. And uh, my, my college roommate, Richie Slack, my best friend, to the, one of my best friends to this day, uh, after after two or three days, he said to me, he said, he calls me Jar. He says, Jar, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but 
it's odd. Why don't you sleep with a pillow, right? So I said, uh, I don't know. What do you mean? Well, you know, I've got two pillows, but it's, it's like really weird that you don't sleep with a pillow. What I didn't realize is my whole life I never had a pillow. We were that poor, right? So now it's Las Vegas. And when we go out to school prior to September starting, you know, it's, it's Riyadh temperature. Yeah. It's, it's a, a desert, right? And he came two days after me to report. I, I got out two days early, August 25th. And he comes in the room. And he says, it's hot as you know what here. <laughs> Put the air conditioner on. Very funny. Do you, do you see an air conditioner? Right? So he says, Jared, what are you talking about? And he walks up, pops a lid on a fan call unit, and presses the air conditioner. I didn't know what a fan call unit was. The only, in homes in Brooklyn, you put them in the window. Yeah. Right? So I stayed there two days in 40 degree heat. Mm -hmm. with no air conditioner because I didn't know what the air conditioner was oh, 17 years old right <laughs> so we've come we've 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 come a long way and um you know I, I never thought it would come to this but uh, here we are how do you blow off steam after uh, a very busy day what do you do for fun جديد اكثر الروتين مع الباقنه الجديده من بيتها جده Fun. <laughs> Fun. Around. You know, um, I may have to dust that chapter off. You know, I'll tell you what, we've won a lot of awards since I've been here. We, you know, people have been very kind and generous. There's one award I wish I didn't win. I don't know if you know this, but for the last five years in a row, I've won no, first place, almost unanimous vote the single most boring person in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I've won this five years in a row, right? Um, we're so dedicated, but here's, here's how I blow off steam. This may sound very corny, uh, because the pressure is immense, and uh, we're, we're executing you know, 20 hour days now, because uh, like I'll give you an idea, on founding day, we had 35,000 construction workers on the site. We're on time and on budget. Thank you, Your Royal Highness. But we had, on founding day, we had 31,000 visits. But what people don't realize about Dereya now, which is the strength of the Crown Prince's relationships and the global positioning of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we're doing between 10 and 15 uh, protocol visits a day from Royal Court or Ministry of Investment, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Finance, certainly Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Tourism. So our protocol department is already over 20 people. So every head of state delegation that comes, it's wonderful for us as a kingdom because everyone is coming. Yep. In 2023, we had over 100 heads of state visit the kingdom to see the crown prince. What other country? I mean, the United States of America, New York City, you know, uh, one of my birthplace, has the United Nations, right? But they all, they all came to see the crown prince for peace, prosperity, r regionally, economic, right? The Crown Prince feels very strongly that if your people are educated, healthy, and employed, prosperity will spread. I happen to agree with that. So uh, we don't really get, I don't really get much time off, but when I do, what I like to do is walk by myself. I chase the protocol guys away, leave me alone for a few hours, and I walk and talk to all the families. And the one thing that I love, 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 love are the little children. Mm -hmm. And they, they're so cute because now they're four or five years old. They want to, mm -hmm. since the Crown Prince did the selfie, they want to do the only one today, a selfie. And that gives me nuclear fuel because I'd love to see families happy, joyful, festive, walking around, proud of their identity, proud of their culture. Five, six years ago, you couldn't be in the Wadi Anifa wild dogs and dead cars and construction rubble you go there now nine kilometers of beautiful parks and everything uh you know our our colleague uh, jane mcgiven she's moving very quickly uh on a major quality of life with the sport boulevard mm -hmm. a great project so all the ceos are working together but that's kind of the way i have my fun 
I mean, it's an attraction, and when you build attractions, people come. You Hopefully. Nest, well, no, I mean, I'm already seeing it, Jerry. Um, yeah. UNESCO obviously plays a big part in, in, in what you do, and, and, and did AIA and UNESCO are, are synonymous. What does your relationship with the UNESCO folks mean to you and to Diraiya and its future? Yeah, it, it, it's gigantically important. And you know, for the first time in the history of Arabia, we did the UNESCO World Summit. And uh, on that summit, we were able to get our seventh UNESCO World Heritage designation. And uh, we believe that we have many more that will come in a pipeline. I feel very strongly about that. But there's three people that deserve uh, monumental praise. Obviously, the Crown Prince is very big on that. But you have to give a lot of praise, maybe four people for sure. You definitely have to praise His Highness Prince Bader, our wonderful Minister of Culture and Governor of, of Alula, because um, his relationship with the, with the Secretary General Audrey Asseline is very close. And we're Executive Committee now, Saudi Arabia. You have to give great uh, credit to Princess Haifa, who up until recently, now she's ambassador, but she did an amazing job in Paris. You have to give great credit, great credit to His Excellency Dr. Fahad al-Samari, who is probably the most, after the king, probably the most respected cultural heritage historian in the kingdom and the chairman of our Cultural and Heritage Committee. And then certainly, last but not least, you have to give amazing credit to Her Royal Highness Princess Sarah bin Fahad um, because she heads up our foundation and her and her great team every day you have to preserve our history. It has to keep its authenticity. Didea is not a theme park, right? It's the source of our identity. It's the source of our national pride. It, you have to hold it as a custodian and make sure that 300 years from now that it, ha it keeps that same identity, right? Okay, we're blessed. We're the custodian of the two holy mosques. Theologically, there is no replacement for Mecca. There is no replacement uh, for the Prophet Muhammad, uh, God bless him, to, uh, for Mecca and Medina, theologically. Culturally, only one Dereya. Um I was fortunate enough to see the model, the, the, the grand master plan of Dereya downstairs. I was blown away by the scale of it. And then I was told how many underground parking spots there were going to be and, and I thought there was an error in their information. It turns out there was no error in their information. 40,000, yeah. The mission is to obviously preserve, like if you're flying by helicopter or by plane, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it's a mud house uh, built a couple hundred years ago or whether it's a state-of-the-art facility. The idea, the mission was to make it look like the buildings of uh, yesteryear, but with all the modern tech and whatever's after fiber optic that is available to us in the world. Is, was that the idea of it all? Yeah, I'm very sophisticated. And True. I'll tell you, this is where the Crown Prince is immensely strict. Uh, now, you would expect that His Majesty uh, would want to keep today a look in the way that it was originally intended, uh, especially being a historian, right? And probably the foremost expert ever uh, on House of Al Saud. But when you take a futurist, quality of life, global leader futurist like the crown prince at his young age, if I'm respectfully allowed to say that, that loves the air as much as his father, okay. right? So now we, I'll give you an illustrative story. We presented the crown prince with uh, the mud bricks of the air. They're dense, they're big. We're making 180 million mud bricks. That's a big job to keep the authenticity of central Najda design, where if you are flying or even walking, it looks like what it did 300 years ago. I'll come back to technology in a moment, right? So we presented them three bricks. They looked exactly the same, but they have different time deliverable issues on how fast you can make them and financial issues. It turns out that the authentic brick of mud, silk, and uh, straw was the most expensive and the most time consuming because you had to make them by hand, 180 million, right? The second one um, had composites in it, right? Uh, other materials, right? Fiberglass, right? Lighter, faster, you could machine make them. <laughs> and then you put like a frosting on them and they look exactly the same. 
And then the third brick, which was basically terracotta or cement covered with, with mud, like a, like a, an M&M. &M, okay. Right? The chocolate, right? Yeah, yeah. Like a peanut M&M, &M, right? The one thing you cannot do in a meeting with the crown prince, I make a joke about it, right? I have a joke. It, 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 probably I'm the only one that could say this, but where I come from, most curse words are a four-letter word, mm -hmm. right, in New York. In the kingdom, the worst word is a five-letter word. If you go to the crown prince and say delay, you better run. He does not accept excuses, right? We have big supply chain issues during COVID. Gigantic three, four meter uh, conduit pipes for new water systems and conduits underground. Nope. You find another way to get it done, right? And I understand them because you have to stay to your... Now, if you have a reasonable explanation, he'll support you. But going back to the three bricks, it's the only time in six years where he's allowed us extra time to do the bricks the right way. That's integrity. That's authenticity. But people think that there's a conflict between technology, modernity, and historical preservation and tradition. Not in his mind. Mm -hmm. Underground, smart city, how you measure your water, air quality, make it easy for your parking. Can you make a reservation? Can, can you go into a museum and see AI of what the Saudi state looked like uh, 300 years ago? All that embracing of technology to, uh, to make quality of life environmentally and quality of life uh, from an entertainment or an educational point of view, fine. But when we walk, right? Now, why was it important to core drill through 8 million cubic meters of rock? We took out 700 thousand rock trucks right because he he saw he envisioned Dereya to be culturally but walkable the largest cultural pedestrian friendly city in the world he didn't see in his image a chaotic vibrant uh, Cairo or even a somewhat chaotic kinetic vibrant Rome mm -hmm. He saw a Florence, a Marrakesh, a Fez, a Siena, where people are happy walking to pray, walking to university, riding their bike to school or to work or to the house. That's why DG1, Dede1, historical Dede, is walkable. But you had to put all the smart city technology underground. Genius. Yeah, truly. The, the villas as well, I mean, is, is uh, that is hopefully going to pull in you know these up-and-coming saudis who want to move from your conventional villas uh on other parts of the city to perhaps call today a home that's a huge project for well, there's no there's no doubt about it now what's interesting about the concentric circles of today a one and today a two with the residences is that depending on your preference now in today a two we will have the silicon valley of the kingdom we will have the enter we will have the media city we will have the entertainment city, 500 tech companies, 100 media companies, 50 entertainment companies. This is very interesting because even looking at the residential law of uh, renting, leasing, or buying, uh, the kingdom has done a lot of work on that. And before the summer or right around the summer, certainly by latest the fall, the laws will have changed where not just all Saudis, but all expats can... Uh, rent, lease, or buy uh, residences. Now, if you want to be in the middle of the city where you can walk, because we never had walkable cities in, uh, in, in, um, in the kingdom. Uh, Jeddah's moving that way as well, which we're thrilled about. But you can. Now, if you want the more traditional private villas, concentrically in, in DG1, you'll go to DG2 because that, that's more uh, consistent with larger space villas not internally externally right but we think we think we're going to have a very high quality of life urban and uh, we just put 106 in in december 106 of the ritz carlton residences they sold very quickly um, now we're getting ready to do uh, baccarat we're putting other residences on sale we have our wadi spa which is spectacular that we now we're we're, we're putting uh, now a hundred of those big farms on sale 
So um, I saw a video of Wadi Safar. Yeah, I was bl- spectacular. Blown away. 60 kilometers. It is unbelievable. That will be like right now, if people, one of the talking points, if you look at Dedea and you don't understand it, think about Beverly Hills mm-hmm. within Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. That's a cultural Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. But Wadi Safar is the Bel Air. Okay. And when the city comes to 15 million people in its evolution, which it will, we're planning it now, as you know, the Royal Commission for Riyadh City, um, Wadi Sfar becomes an oasis in the middle of the city. Have you gotten happier with age, Jerry? Um, I, 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 that's a really great question. I don't think, I, I can't say I've gotten happier. I think I've, I've evolved even ahead of happiness. Happiness is very fluid. It, happiness is not very deep. Hmm. Uh, happiness is very shallow. I've become more content. And that's much deeper water. Because when you get older, if you stay true to your values and your principles and you wake up every day saying, please show me the way. And then at night before you go to bed, you say, look, I, I hope I served you well today. If I did well, allow me to do it again. If I didn't allow me the strength to apologize and just endeavor to do better. So happiness is a, it, it, happiness is an illusion. It, it actually is. It's very shallow. It, it's good to be happy, mm-hmm. right? But I think contentment is a much deeper body of water because it allows you uh, an understanding of of what your meaning is, what your purpose is. The top part of it is it it doesn't really guide you. Happiness doesn't guide you. But contentment allows you to live with yourself and and that will determine your level of uh, accomplishment, service, and relationship with others. Is there anything missing or is there anything else that's out there for you to achieve besides Dir'iyya coming to full fruition? Well, uh, I think, uh, yes, there's two things. One always wants to have a sense of purpose. Now, in the old American adage of retirement after 65, that, that that's been blown up now, what did one do, mother or father, right? Did I, did I instill the values of my family to my children or my grandchildren? Is my mission now devoted to my children or my grandchildren? I've done my, I've done my work. I provided for my family. I educated my family. I served my country. If it was a military type of thing. Um, so now in my last years, it's comical now, 65 up, um, I can sit back. But uh, there was a, there was a, uh, it didn't evolve well that way. What, what you now know is, do I maintain a sense of purpose? Okay. Am I in a situation where I'm allowed to contribute to empower the next generation to instill the values that join us together as a humanity? I talked about civility. Yes. Right? Big word, to be civil to one another. How about the word humanity? Right? We are all the same humans, right? So can I instill the next generation to take what we did generationally well and, and, and carry it as a baton to them and teach them what we didn't do well, ruining the environment, being coarse to one another, right? And then, and then just to say, to thy own self be true. You know, when, when we talk about the difference between happiness and contentment, biggest and hardest lesson in all of life is to be still. Now, this is very deep and I hope not too heavy, but generally in every religion, in every language around the world, when someone passes away, everybody says the same thing, rest in peace, right? Because you wish at the end of your life that God will allow you to rest in peace. You're dead. So I am teaching myself now at 70 a new concept, 
and I'm, I'm trying my best to teach myself. And once I learn it, once I, then I can pass it on to someone else. And that is SIP, not rest in peace, sit in peace. How do you finish your day where you're content with who you are, what your mission, what your purpose is, and then you cannot be selfish. It's contrary to serving. You have to take that, right? You know, Star Wars and Yoda and, you know, you want to be a Jedi. Yeah. So if you become the Jedi, you got to teach the new Jedis. It's an obligation. It's a human humanity obligation and it's a civilization obligation. It's not quick fix. I'll run all over you if I win. Because you know what's going to happen if you get that win? You're going to be alone and you're not going to be happy with yourself. And you're not going to be content. And what you need to do at some particular point in your life is you have to know how to sit in peace. And that, that's a beautiful thing. I have a few sentences and I'm going to ask you to finish them for me. The thing I value most in life today is? Serving and I see service as nobility and being able to take all I've been privileged with and pass it on to the next generation. Beautiful. The thing that bothers me in life most is? Selfishness and hubris. Wow. I wish I knew this when I was younger. How to sit still. Are you better at that today? Yeah, getting better. But it takes a long time, huh? You know, what I say to my daughter since she's been born, it's the hardest lesson, hardest lesson on life. To thy own self be true. And your happiness, if that's the word, or your contentment, the deeper word, will come when you realize that you're the captain of your ship. Your parents will do their best to steer you in the right direction, but your parents are guardians, right? What you have to do is you have to steer yourself in the right direction, and that's not easy when you're young. You got false propellants, ambition, uh, materialization. These are false propellants. The things that ground you, right? You know, when we were, when we were growing up, we had very cheap $5 punching bags, and you blew the thing up, and it had, it looked, it, it had a little top with a face, and it had a big ball of sand on the bottom of it. And you'd punch it, and it'd come back up, right? What you want in your life is that bottom of sand. You're going to get a lot of punches in the face. Mm -hmm. But if you're grounded, you know, there's a beautiful saying. A mighty wind cannot disturb a tree with, with strong roots. Yeah. See, that's where the kingdom is strong. The kingdom's got strong roots and great leadership. But if you can teach yourself emotionally to invest during your life to put sand in the bottom, mm -hmm. when the storms come, they're not going to knock you over. Yeah. And by the way, if you think the storms are not coming, they're coming. Okay. He, they're coming. There is no such thing as a perpetual rainy day. And by the way, God created contrast for a reason. Mm -hmm. So when you salt, pepper, sweet, sour, so you could appreciate both, right? I want to be remembered for kindness and being to the best of my ability an inspiration to the next generation to lead with the values that were imparted on us. And to there's another maybe a nuance to that, that where I went, when I left one way or another, it was better than when I came. Well, I mean, Jerry, I see when I saw you at HCI, the event of a few weeks ago, just the sheer volume of people that follow you around. I'm not talking protocol, I'm talking fans. You've had an effect on these people. They, they really appreciate your presence, your stories. Thank you, that means and, a lot to me. And, but, but I mean, you're such a kind, generous soul. So, uh, I mean, if I can, uh, and, and I hate using the word I, but if I can just say, I think you've achieved the kindness that you say that you want to be remembered for. Well, we, we would always, you can always uh, be more kind. You know, you can, now, I'm no angel. If you talk to my 96-year-old mother, she'll give you an earful, right? Uh, if you talk to my wife and daughter, they'll give you an earful. You know, excellence, if everybody could execute excellence, it'd be different. It's in the details. It's in the passion. 
but you have to have the fortitude to see them through. And that's why I believe it's such a privilege for me to be here because my number one reason of being here is because the people I work with every day or my neighbors in the community, they are my fuel. You know, when I talk to young people in hospitality, I say to them, if the guests you serve take your energy, you will have a good season or two. But if the guests you serve are the source of your energy, mm. you'll, have, you'll have long seasons like me. So when I, when I wake up every day and I'm, I'm coming off, uh, I've been pretty tired lately. When I wake up every day, okay, let's go. You know, and I say two things to myself after my prayers, and I steer me in the right direction, big man. But then I say the same thing to myself. I've been doing it for 50 years. When, when I leave my door, showtime, let's go, let's go. You know, and then when I get home and the door closes, okay, the curtain's down, mm -hmm. you know. But you, you have an obligation to your community. We, we, we were at one point the Today Gate Development Authority. Now we're three entities, the Today Gate Development Authority, the Today a Foundation, and the Today a Company, which, which the PIF company, they've been wonderful. Um, but when I go out there now, I say to my team every day, Here's a measurement if you're a good neighbor. I don't want to be an authority. I want to be a good neighbor. So here's the measurement. I have to be able to walk outside any day. I do it every day. And it hasn't been easy with land acquisition, let me tell you. But I, I have to have the ability to go to my neighbors and say, is your life better today than when I came? If the answer is no, I'm not doing my job. Because the Crown Prince has given me all the resources. He's given us all the resources to make sure that their lives and that of their families are better as it pertains to Didea. You know, nationally, that's the ministers to do that. But, but Didea, we want to make it one of the great gathering places in the world. We're already doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, only one today. I'm proud of it. We want to we wanna make sure that we're good neighbors to the best of our ability, and we want to inspire the next generation of Saudi superstars to be the best embodiment of themselves, not to be the richest, that will come. But when you see yourself, if you're a Saudi at 14, 24, 34, 44, when you see yourself, are you happy with what you see? The kingdom will give you those resources where the answer should be more uh, affirmative. Think about all the countries in the world now. You know, now the G7, my beloved United States of America, Highly polarized right now. Can't have a conversation. Most American families now will tell you that they don't believe that their lives or their children will be better than their lives. This is not a good thing. You have to be optimistic and positive to your future. So I think the kingdom is blessed. I think we're unbelievably blessed to have two uh, visionary leaders at one time. Um, I think what the kingdom has right now, besides extraordinary talent, is that it's optimistic and positive. And, I, and it's a privilege and an honor to be part of that. And if that's all you have in life, optimism um, and, uh, and, and, and excitement, I mean, that's really, that's probably like half the battle to get you there. Yeah, and then the other half is purpose, yeah. right? You have, to, you have to have purpose. Now, if you impose upon yourself a sense of obligation, and it's a, it's a heavy burden to make things better than when you, you were there, that's, that's heavy lifting. So people who serve in public, you know, many of our ministers came from private sector because they wanted to contribute to the Crown Prince's vision. It's a big sacrifice because in private sector, you're the captain of the ship. When you go into the public sector, your public is the captain of the ship. You're not the captain of the ship. Different ballgame. Way different. And the sacrifices are, are unbelievable. You know, and you know, now when I go out, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting because... I get those who are uh, thankful for whatever small contribution I'm making, uh, playful, we'll do it only one today. I love the families, I love the children. That means a lot to me. I get those that want something, quid pro quo, and I can weigh you out because every single day somebody wants something. Buy my mattresses, buy my cement, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I have those who have to take the uh, sacrifice of what it takes to build these giga projects and that is very emotional very painful but in the greater good of what vision 2030 is going to be and when you look at the kingdom as a whole in 2030 
it will be unrecognizable. And when you look at the kingdom in 2040, I don't think there's a single country that will have that level of transformation in that short a period of time. You know, when the Crown Prince gave his epic Fox interview in English, globally, which got widespread praise. It is. You know, uh, Brett Bayer asked him last question. Um, you know, thank you, Your Royal Highness. And the Crown Prince, without even non-rehearsed, the great success story of the millennium, of the new year, is going to be the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You want in, you're welcome. You don't, God bless you, type of thing. You know, not those same words. But his, his, his meaning was, watch and help us. You know, finally, Vision 2030, we will take whatever it takes, resource-wise, to invest in our own people and make sure they have a great quality of life, healthy, happy, want to use that word, uh, educated, right, that they believe in their future. But where we don't have the expertise in the country yet while we're developing our own people, we will attract the best and brightest people to come to the kingdom to help us on our mission and ensure that they're treated with dignity and respect while they're helping us on our mission. That's really bold and benevolent, and you have to give them amazing credit on that. So you've seen how it played out with other countries who put their people first, and you see that happening today on the ground. And when you do that, it only ends one way, when you put your people at the forefront of giving them everything that they ever wished for. But you have to be benevolent, and you have to be honest, and the Crown Prince is both. You look at Singapore. You look at what Lee Kuan Yew did in 60 years, right? You know, the crown prince may be able to accomplish most of that in 20, you know, and I'm not just talking GDP and, you know, all, all sociological metrics and commercial metrics. He'll get those, right? But look what he did, right? Now, you look at other countries that are wealthy, that have unbelievable human resources, but are based on, uh, on um, uh, corruption or selfishness from their leaders, right? I could... You know, you, I don't want to, I could give you a lot of examples, but I don't want to pick on a certain person. But if you have, if you have benevolence, vis, vision, benevolence, focus, right? So if someone ever asked me, what is the principal mandate as you see it? Because it's only one person's opinion. You know, the Crown Prince uh, may not agree with me, although I think he would. What, what do you think is on His Royal Highness's mind every day, right? but you only have one sentence. I, I don't need a sentence. Three words, quality of life, right? And he's focused on that, right? It's not about giga projects for the sake of giga projects. They all have a purpose. They all fit in to, to right. Yeah, so we go. Um, two final questions. <clears throat> What's the worst advice you were ever given? And then on the contrary side, What's the best advice you can leave me with that we can pass on to the up and coming Saudi? So let's start with the worst advice that you recall ever be. Yeah, I, I, I had someone who was very fond of me and uh, I was speaking altruistically of why I was doing things in the community in Houston, Texas, but I wasn't paid for my community activity. And someone sat down with me and said, look, I'm going to give it to you straight. That's nonsense that you're not being paid. And let me just give you this advice. When they say it's not about the money, it's about the money. By the way, God does not, when you, when, when you meet him, he's not looking at your bank book. He's looking, what did you do to further goodness and kindness in this world? So that's terrible advice. What you're going to find out is that if you're selfish and you step over people and you become rich, you're going to find yourself empty and rich. And when you sit still, you're not going to like what you see. Okay? So that's the worst advice. The best advice given, uh, and again, it's humorous, especially with my raspy voice, for an Italian kid from Brooklyn to quote Shakespeare, but I will from Romeo and Juliet. And Juliet says to Romeo, the more I give to thee, the more I have, mm -hmm. right? And this is very, very true. 
It's one of the great, it's in every holy book. It's in the Bible, it's in the Quran, it's in the, the give and you shall receive. Do not worry about the rewards, awards, rewards. They will come, right? So the best, the best advice is service is noble. One final caveat. I gave a TED Talk and I put two Latin words in a TED Talk and I said, there's two words in Latin that trouble me and I hope they trouble you, right? One of them was subservient, okay? So I said in the TED Talk, who came up with that word? I'd like to meet that person and I'd like to give them a nice slap on the hand. Because you serve, you are below? Subservient? You serve your noble, that's, God sees that. So who, who rendered service to below? That's a bad word, subservient. And the other one, which is an equally bad word, is subordinate. The people you work with are below you? Who came, that's a slap on the other hand. Hmm. Subservient, subordinate, no, no, no. The people you serve with are noble. They must be treated with dignity and respect, right? You do, in, in, in DGDA, I've terminated people, not many, for being disrespectful. We do not tolerate it here. People come, you're entitled dignity, self-respect, beautiful, clean prayer rooms, work environment, food, because you are to be honored in your service, right? So I don't like those words. So the closing thing on service is serve with all your heart, service is nobility. If you serve with all your heart, all of the awards, all of the rewards will fall into place naturally. And the biggest reward is that you at some point, hopefully earlier than me, will be able to sit still and, and like what you see. And like what you see. The, the Arabic language or the Arabic culture supports what you just said. There's a, there's a famous Arabic proverb that says, Khadim al-Qom Sayyidum. Khadim Is there, not higher, but Sayyidum is there, you know, is, 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 is someone that uh, you should look up to. Comes from you. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. just, you know, support so you he said thank you so much. No, it's me to thank you, Sikran. Thank you, what you do for us. Thank you. No, my great pleasure. I wish everybody a very blessed Ramadan. You know, I'm if I'm allowed to say this, I'm very proud of you. You embody everything we talked about, Saudi Arabia. You embody this, you and your your generation. And what we were able to accomplish, you're gonna easily as a generation eclipse all of us. And God bless you and you're going to find it at some particular point. It's going to happen faster than you think. You're going to be sitting and you're going to have a chance to look back and there's a little bit of road behind you because you got, you know, you got all those miles. But you want to be happy, to, your, to use your word or content to my word, to look behind you and not see a lot of uh, road damage. Yeah. And, and I'm sure, you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, Jerry, your fingerprints are going to be, you know, not just all over the project of the Aya, but of Saudi Arabia as well. Well, I thank you. You know, in, in Islam, we don't we don't draw attention to our dead like uh, in, in Catholicism. We have big, elaborate tombstones. But I think in the Wadi, most people, when I'm gone, will know it's me because you'll see a, a hand sticking out of the ground with, a, with an only one today. Rob. Hey, that looks like Jerry. I just hope it's the right finger. <laughs> When they bury me, when you bury me, just make sure it's the right finger, okay? Thanks for your time. Shukran. Shukran. Thank you so much. Very proud of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Ciao.